Uh, hello, everyone. I am Linnea Nelson, Ecosystem Manager of Open IDL, um, and I will be moderating uh, the discussion today. And I will kick it off to Joan to introduce herself. Hello, I'm Joan Zerkovich, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Operations for American Association of Insurance Services. And I also serve as a technology lead in the organization. And in that role, I, I am the executive sponsor of OpenIDL, uh, a project under the Linux Foundation. Great, and Tram, if you wanna introduce yourself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Trambo. I am CEO and co-founder of Mobi. And um, my background is not a technologist at all. So I think I'm <laughs> not, not the non-technologist on this panel. It's actually was in chemistry and then I went on to art conservation and then got into blockchain, got excited. Uh, look at it from the intellectual property management of that. And of course that leads to mobility and smart city because we all in the digital age produce content. And um, in 2018, I'll launch Mobi along with my co-founder, Chris Ballinger. Great. Good Thank afternoon, you. everyone. Um, my name is Ryan Briggs. I'm a part of Swift Free Solutions and I lead a function called Automotive and Mobility Solutions for North America within Swift Free. We focus on uh, technologies, data products, and consulting services that help our partners in the insurance industry uh, better price risk and create innovative, innovative products. Awesome. And James, last but not least. Yeah. Uh, James Madison. Um, I've been at the Hartford for 21 years. I'm an architect in the data office, and I'm on the governing board of uh, OpenIDL. Awesome. Uh, well, I want to thank all of the attendees here today. This should be a great discussion with our panelists, um, and I'm excited to learn from them. So we'll kick it off. Uh, blockchain hit the insurance industry by storm about five to seven years ago, promising to solve all of its problems. Um, and its reputation has dropped as it did not solve all of the industry's problems. But uh, we're in a great position now uh, knowing one, that the technology works, and two, where the technology best fits as a solution. So it's no longer a solution looking for a problem, it's actually solving problems. So we'll jump right in and see what today's panelists have to say about blockchain's evolution within the industry. So uh, the first question I have, um, panelists, can you describe your perspective on the life so far of blockchain in the industry and where after its ups and downs, it best fits as a solution to enterprise level industry problems and what areas within the industry that it best fits. Well, I'm happy to jump in and start the conversation. Sure. Um, I think blockchain within the industry suffered uh, as a lot of uh, trials with the use of the technology did from the confusion around Bitcoin, uh, which is one way to use the technology versus the many other ways that the technology could be used to solve real business problems. And um, with that, there were a number of consortia that came together to see how blockchain could solve some problems that we had with the exchange of information and data. Um, and in those uh, trials, the technology always worked. That really wasn't a problem. Um, it was really the business models around the use of the technology. So we do know that the application of blockchain technology to keeping data secure and private and immutable records, all of that works. But how do you form a network that can take advantage of that technology? Uh, it's not like it's a single application that you can pull off the shelf and install and you're finished. It requires businesses to come together to form a network to agree how to operate using this technology. And I think that's really where we've struggled with um, the success is the business model, not the technology. I couldn't yeah, agree more. A great point. Go ahead, Jim. I, I couldn't agree more. I, even though Mobi, when we launched in 2018, uh, our history went back a couple of years and it started out, uh, many of the now Mobi members were very excited about blockchain and the potentials with all the uh, issues that the industry were having, data privacy 
and uh, connectivity and all that. Um, what they found out is that when they do a POC, a small scale POC, and they can put a vehicle on change, service on change, all that was possible. Um, but their, their application couldn't scale. It's because everybody keep using decentralized technology and building centralized platform. Uh, for example, BMW spent a lot of money building a supply chain platform, but couldn't convince other car makers to go onto it because it belongs to BMW. Uh, Daimler Mercedes did the same thing for mass multimodal, uh, and DHL did the same thing for logistics. And, and they waste millions and millions of dollars. And due to that, that's why we founded Mobi, uh, so that we can create standards, standards like how to identify uh, vehicles, things, people, a trip, when does a trip begin? When does it end? That needs to be also to identify how to settle a business transaction. Those need to, to be standardized. Uh, and then the second thing is how do we offer business automation for the ecosystem using decentralized ownership, decentralized platform, uh, and, and build that out? Great. Decentralized is the key there. I agree with you. Tram that um, a lot of these models had a, a small number of participant, participants and they were still working in that centralized model and inherent in a blockchain network is a decentralized model. It's a network. And I think that's where we're really starting to have some success now is now that we understand that through all these trials, we're now moving in the right direction. And uh, really quickly, just for our audience um, who may not be, you know, as well versed in, uh, you know, the vernacular that we are used to, um, can someone define, you know, the difference between centralized, a true centralized and a true decentralized blockchain network? James, I don't know if you want to <laughs> take a stab at that one. Yeah, no, that's fine. I'll, I'll keep it simple. No, I mean, blockchain, the technology is <clears throat> extremely well proven. It, what you're seeing is some of the silliness of the use cases that came and went around it. Uh, maybe some are still going. Um, no, it's the idea that everybody gets a copy of the ledger and everybody can verify what everybody's done in the past and nobody can deny what they've done. Um, so that we all have it and that nobody's allowed to have 51% ownership because, you know, that kind of thing. All those safeguards are in place. So it's just the idea that we all know what we've all done and we, nobody can deny it and such that everybody has a copy of it as opposed to some trusted authority. It's like, well, I believe the, the bank because the bank is reliable and they've been around 150 years or whatever. That's a more of a centralized model. So the notion that it's decentralized and that all the peers have to agree on it to some degree, you know, without getting to nuances is the key. We all have a copy. We all trust it because everybody else is trusting it. And if we don't trust our peers, then the whole thing shuts down anyway. That has nothing to do with the technology. Um, the thing about the blockchain, right, is it, it's a question of the use case. And so the open idea, the use case that the Harvard is most concerned about is, is being able to, to have extremely high security and control over our data. Um, and so if you can get this model to work, it, it provides that. Um, and I say if simply because this is a massive effort, right? So it's not if in terms of the technology or the idea, um, it's the execution and the number of people you have to bring to bear on it and the number of standards you have to publish. So any any hesitation I might seem to have is strictly around execution and just the sheer effort to get this done as opposed to the, the design itself. The design itself is elegant, which for me simplifies down to instead of sending data to the query, you send query to the data. That's the fundamental difference, right? So we as a company are not comfortable sending our data out anywhere more than we have to. And so there's a, a very simple principle of computer science that says you can send data to some place and then that place can query it all they want. Well, the problem is they might query more than you want, right? So we don't want to send our data anywhere. So we want to keep our data here. And you say, no, you send me the query. And if I like your query, I'll let it execute and I'll, I'll give you the results. And those results better be very rolled up so you can't detect things I don't want you to detect. So that's the fundamental shift. So that business case is what we want. And that theoretically in computer science goes back decades, right? Who knows, probably to the 50s for all I know. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you want to get there, but getting there is really hard. It's actually pretty simple to just hurl your data to somebody else and like an insurance officer or whatever, right? And just let them do their thing. Um, it's really hard to structure your data in a way that allows you to bring in queries, get only the results set back and send it. But doing that and then doing that on the blockchain is what we're interested in, mostly because it just, it lets us keep our data. And we say, yeah, I don't like your query. I'm not letting that go in. Oh, I do like that query. I will let that one go in. And, that's the, and that whole, the gating of all those queries is also a key uh, design principle that we're looking at too. Awesome, thank you. That was great. And Ryan, you know, from your perspective, um, you know, having this high level view of the industry and bringing and creating new solutions for your clients, um, for carriers, uh, where do you see, you know, the decentralized model being, um, you know, essential to your work, your vision? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yes, I think uh, blockchain and uh, the distributed data sets have an opportunity to really stimulate 
innovation. There is so much innovation, especially in the areas that I focus in, in the automotive and mobility space, where there's new technologies, new business models that didn't exist previously. So insurers really cannot wait for five years of developed last history on any given one of those things because you'll be constantly waiting. Um, it won't ever happen. So, um, and really the pace of vehicle safety technology for one specific example is far outpacing the, the rating models um, that are prepared to, to to use there. So I think in stimulating innovation is a key use case for a, a distributed model such as this. And it was occurring to me um, in preparation for this that there's a, a, a behavior that it has a promise to change. When it infers, you know, by nature, don't have data to understand a risk or don't understand the risk, their behavior is naturally to withdraw from it. And that is really a um, the promise that that we need to reverse. So instead of withdrawing from that risk, to use a collaborative approach to understand it better, and perhaps look for data sources, a network, if you will, that can better inform that risk. Um, the, to, and so you can attack it and 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 address it for the good of of the insurers and society. That's the behavior that I would like to see that come from this. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so as far as, you know, blockchain, and we covered this a little bit, um, but as far as blockchain models go, uh, here we're referring to solutions built on an open source, decentralized, permission-based blockchain network held together by an open governance model. And, um, you know, panelists, why do you think this is the best model suited to solve enterprise level industry prob problems? Um, you know, and maybe not to dive too deeply, but we can use examples of where previous models or consortia have not worked and maybe describing why this model um, is landing uh, landing in the sweet spot. Well, first, John, if you it, want to yeah. take that, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, first look at the model of the internet. Why do we use it? Why do all businesses use it? We use it because it's open source. It's not controlled by a single vendor, a single group. It is open and it's accessible. Any company, small to large, can join and participate in the network in web-based services. Uh, they can afford it. It's accessible. Um, and you know, going back to what Ryan mentioned, it provides a place for innovation. So if you think about extending that model to a problem that we've encountered while we've started to use the internet. That's great. We love that, but we're still struggling with data privacy and security, um, trusting it, centralization. Those things didn't go away. And so that's a problem we have to solve. So when we go to solve that problem, we have to go back to those core principles again, which is open, building a decentralized model, not centralized, decentralized, that enables everyone to come and participate and control uh, the destiny of their data, right? We control where it's held, it's still held in-house, just like we do today with any information we provide over the web. We, we hold that information in-house and we control where information goes or how it's exchanged. And so if you think about uh, the networks that are developing to solve that problem, and in, in this case, blockchain has proven to solve a lot of the problems with data security and privacy and all of that, we're going to hold to those core principles, open source, decentralized, allow the endpoints to control what's happening to their data. Um, to me, that that's really critical. And the other uh, part of the question is, you know, where have blockchain initiatives um, struggled in the past? I think it's, again, forgetting those principles that very, a lot of these initiatives were um, initiated under consortia of large players in an industry, right? Because they had the resources, the staff to go test the possibilities but they didn't have the benefit of what it meant to the entire industry, the smallest players, those that don't have the technical sophistication that maybe the early participants do. And, um, you know, they can't afford a, a 250,000 outlay for software and then you join a consortia and then you run this once you hire the staff to manage it. That's that's where the struggles have come in, where we've tried to create these kind of centralized 
somewhat proprietary models. And so again, if you want the success, we have to start simply on an open source solution, make it very easy for all the players to enter, and then let the innovation happen on top of that. Let the carriers, now that they have the tools, very simple set of tools, just like the very simple web services that, init that initially were available, yeah. they'll find the best way to build on top of that network. Absolutely. Anyone else? Uh, Tram, do you have yes, any um, thoughts I, here? Yes, um, I couldn't couldn't say it better, uh, Joan. To totally yeah. agree. But, uh, we both we both are from consortia uh, point of view. Uh, from the beginning, uh, we if you look at any industry, there's hundreds of thousands of ecosystem stakeholders. They're public. They're private. Uh, they all have unique databases. They all have unique processes. Mm -hmm. They all have different regulation depending where they, they are uh, for handling business processes and handling customer PII. So if you have these hundreds and thousands of, if not um, millions of different requirements, how do you have business automation happen for all these uh, stakeholders? And I think there are five key things that, that we need to keep in mind, and some of them are repetitive uh, of what we've been saying. Is uh, First is zero trust authentication. So that means every entity must be identified and authenticated for every transaction. Um, and that any data credentials or claims must be non-repudiable. I have problems pronouncing that word. <laughs> and the second thing is data privacy. That means uh, regulatory compliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jurisdiction are having that in Europe and now in the US, many states are having that now. And then you have to have limit access to intended recipient only. So you're not opening up your database to anybody who wants to come and do business with you. Uh, the third thing is data security and selective disclosure. Uh, that means you don't want to connect to centralized databases to do business. Um, as, as James was saying, you want to push the data to the edge and do uh, business at the edge. And then you want to be able to selectively disclose or verify information at the moment of transaction and not have to store the data before, during, or after. Uh, nobody collecting it. And then the solution, um, as uh, been said, it has to be affordable, interoperable, scalable, and extendable. So to meet all those requirements, we have to use standards. There has to be standards based. It has to be platform agnostic, uh, universal translator, as we call them, that works with any legacy system that could work with a mom and pop's little, little store that makes a little nuts and bolts for a vehicle uh, and a big companies that makes batteries. Uh, and they don't have to do, build new infrastructure or continually maintain the infrastructure or integrate with somebody else's platform. Um, and then decentralized ownership. It has to be community owned and operated. And I think those five, those five things I think works, um, then business automation happen. Everybody can come and play. Yeah, if I can That's build on that too, because you hit one mm -hmm. with really good language. I love that selective disclosure at the transaction level. You said the selective disclosure, I read it a little bit, but the, the idea of, of we can approve every individual query. See, one of the challenges you have traditionally with data is that if you give people rights to the data, now they can query in, in any number of ways, right? But if you have the ability to say on a per transaction basis, yes, I'll let this win and no, I won't, that selective disclosure on a per transaction basis is absolutely critical to the entire design. So I love that point. Um, two things that matter for me too is, is the, the notion of the standards, right? Standards, particularly around the data model. So in principle, this whole network can do things besides insurance once, once at scale, right? But I'm in an insurance company. So my question is insurance, but if you're gonna send the data to the query, excuse me, <laughs> query to the data, let me get that right, right? <laughs> the data has to have a certain predictable shape. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to fire a query out to 100 carriers or whatever, let's just keep using insurance, right? If I fire this out, this query out, the data structure has to be in a certain shape. I need to expect to find a vehicle object when I need to find it. The third attribute mm -hmm. that th on that thing better be number of doors, right? So you do have to have a common data structure in order to do this. So one of the biggest things I'm watching for is in, in contributing to as much as I can is, is the, uh, the data model. So that, that's consistent and that's going down a, a good path. Um, and then the other thing I do observe is, is the openness because the one thing that no vendor product can compete with is open. And, and so there are vendor products that have some of this functionality, sometimes a lot of this functionality, right? So the, the idea of, of sending the query of the data instead of the data of the query, the idea of, of selective disclosure, et cetera, um, 
th those are standard principles. Anybody can go out there and code them. It's, it's in many vendors self-interest to do it. And you can find these functionalities in vendor platforms, but they're always going to be proprietary. So it, it may take a while for open source to go. I mean, let's, I love open source, but it's like, yeah, it's like, I don't know. It, it's, it's a lot of opinions and a lot of things that you have to kind of work together. So it may be a little slower to try to get a whole world community onto an open source project, but it will always be open. Whereas a vendor product, yeah, if they want to, they could pay a hundred engineers to slam that thing out the door and have it in the next product release, but they're always going to be closed. So to me, that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest differentiators too, is that it is inherently open. And so it may take us some time to get all this functionality to fully function, but it will always be open and that's key. Yeah. And, I, and I think just to add to that, one of the um, areas that open IDL felt was important right from the beginning was to include the regulators. Because all of these solutions that are being developed, they are being developed for an industry. And the role of the regulators is uh, in part to make sure that an industry operates in a fair and transparent manner. And they need to be able to understand how that industry is operating. So if it's closed and they can't understand how that technology is working or whether it's discriminatory to somebody in that uses the products or even to a group of businesses in the industry, that can't, that's a struggle for the regulators. They, so they really need to understand any of these networks that are developing and open IDL from day one has worked collaboratively with the regulators so that they understand open, right? We, they weren't connected to the open community. So they've learned a lot about it as our participants have. Um, and they're very excited about it because it meets their need of, of that transparency into what's going on. Absolutely. And, you know, with that, um, you know, I want to toss it over to Ryan and maybe, um, you know, on the note of regulators and working with them, you know, Ryan, where do you see, um, you know, the possibility of matching, <clears throat> you know, in auto our rating system to the technology and where it's at and, you know, how the regulators and why they will be so important in that process as well? Yeah, I think there's a there's a parallel um, actually with with regulators because regulators have domain over a certain you know political geography um, and they want a functioning market within that place. All right, um, reinsurance actually has uh, I don't think it's a stretch of analogy a similar function where we uh, as a reinsurer have domain globally and the reason for that is that it's distributing risk via risk transfer. Um, from insurance companies, but um, operating globally so that we can balance risk in, in that way. So when you have a what a what a regulator for a specific uh, political geography is looking for is market non-performance in their place, whether it be behavior or the worst case is um, risks that can't be covered because then those insureds are in jeopardy. Um, and we we see we see behaviors like this like in in my space this is one uh, uh, area as an industry commercial motor risk has been unprofitable as an industry for going on I think like 15 years now right so so all you know some uh, dedicated line insurers have gone out of business many are just subsidizing it in in, in other places why hasn't this problem been solved? Right? Why? You know what? What's what's going on with that? So within a given you know uh, market, what's happening is insurers do what they do. They are trying to write better good risks and less bad risks. And the the what happens is the bad risks either go to another carrier who tries to do the same thing, or they those bad risks go out of business. Right. And in some ways, especially when the rest of us tear the same roads and our livelihoods, you know, and, and literally life is at jeopardy based on the risk of uh, other people operating, I don't think it's actually serving the market well to have from an insurance perspective or from a societal perspective. So I, I see opportunities such as, you know, within the technologies that are just discussing, and I'm not getting into to that, I see the, oppor the opportunity for collaboration um, to really resolve different risks. Use across um, uh, insurance carrier platforms such as, you know, centered around a regulatory um, 
uh, opportunity or centering around a risk capacity opportunity to try to really get at those problems and, and solve them for the greater good. Absolutely. That was beautifully said. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to just, you know, uh, illuminate the elephant in the room as well and talk about um, the challenges, uh, you know, in the past, the challenges we're facing now, but also, you know, once we overcome these challenges, the uh, opportunities that we do have. Um, so I'll let Joan, I'll let you pick this one off too. Well, yes, th there are always challenges uh, building a new system. And uh, certainly as um, James mentioned earlier, building a network is more of a challenge than a vendor supplied solution that you can just go buy off the shelf and, and implement it. So that's really been the challenge of bringing these new solutions in. It does require data standards um, and that takes some time, but I think the, the challenge uh, to the groups that are doing is keep it simple, right? Start very small, define those standards in a way that you can grow them over time. Get members into the network, start building that, that network over time uh, iteratively so that you understand the value of the standards, the data that's being used, the solutions that are being built on top of that. Uh, so when you see a big problem like that, it's best to kind of break it up and, and make progress a, a little bit at a time. Um, and, you know, I, the example that I give most often is uh, for folks to go back and remember at the beginning of the internet, if you're, if you're around at that time, uh, there were centralized solutions. There were vendors that provided network capabilities on their single platform. And um, they were all offering solutions at the time the internet was being built. And how was it built? It was built through the collaboration of industry with the National Science Foundation and researchers all over the world. And, and it took many years to develop it. Um, and they developed the network and then some physicists came up with this idea of exchanging documents across the network using this web thing that they thought was a good idea. And I think if you were to look back, way back then, you would say, oh, building this network is really big and it's really hard and, and I'm not really sure if it's going to be useful. And they have this crazy idea to exchange documents across this network, but, every, but because it was open and people were building it iteratively, the physicists started exchanging documents. And they started developing some standards around how information is exchanged and how this web thing was going to be used. And I, and I remember where they said, yeah, you connect going HTTP colon slash slash. And everybody said, oh, nobody will ever use that. That's just too hard. Um, they said, well, it's what we've got. So they started building web platforms. And today we're still typing HTTP colon. It, it wasn't the, the usefulness of the service was so great that um, as we've evolved <clears throat> over time, uh, we never saw in the beginning that you would be conducting banking over a web-based service. And so that's when I think about this is hard. Building a network is hard. Building data standards is hard. Yes, but we've done it before and it resulted in the best solution and we're doing it now. We just need to put one foot in front of the other, solving the problem every day. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, a couple hey, things. Um, yeah, yeah, James, go, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. So four things that I can think of that worry me, right? So one I mentioned before is the data model. I am first and foremost a data person, right? It's like, you know, I, I have a computer science master, so I, I do technology for fun. Unfortunately, I get paid to do data because data is more important. Um, and I'm a data <laughs> bigot, so I know I just made all the software developers out there mad. But um, to me, the data model is the key, right? We got to get the data structure down to the, to the right thing. For better or worse, let's just take something like the stat model that's been around forever. The stat model is, in fact, a well-defined, consistent format that we all use. It just has, you know, all manner of problems. So we have to get just a much more robust model. And I kind of joke that the, the the current model for just for staff filings is, is basically a 1970s model, um, literally. Um, and we use squiggly braces to mean negative numbers and weird stuff like that. Um, and and if, it's, if you ask a question of it and it's wrong, you submit a request, you get another six weeks, you'll get another report and you'll ask another question, you'll wait another six weeks. It's literally a 1970s paradigm. Um, we're trying to get up to just something even as good as just late 90s, early, early 20s. It's a slice and dice kind of interface that we're all used to that every kid out of college can now do in a pivot table. You got to get your data up to that. So we're not even like shooting for rocket science. Forget like, you know, big data and, and bunging and everything else. It's like, look, can I just get up to the, like 
the year 2000 where I can slice and dice and that sort of thing. So that's powerful. But to do that, you have to have the data model structured correctly. You got to get your grain right and all that good stuff. So one is the data model and getting a whole army of, of, of people, carriers and regulators to agree on that is tough. The other one is the go, no go gates. The, it, you're talking about plugging your data into a network. That's, that's scary. It better be really safe, not just safe technologically. Like the crypto is all safe. That's fine. The blockchain is safe. But it, at the application layer, it, you, we have to have gates. So one of the things we want is when you bring a query into our environment, I want to stop that and say, what is that query? Do I trust it? Okay, I think I trust it. Let me run it. Oh, wait a minute. Let me look at the data before that data leaves too. So while it will be on the network, there's got to be stops every step of the way. And if we say, yep, I want to check every step of the way it needs to be there. So we're building in those go, no go gates, I call them. Um, the other thing is you got to have participation counts and, and percentage level. So if we are trying to contribute data to some kind of environment and, and, and it's going to be anonymized in some way by, by through aggregation, it's just like when you do like employee surveys, you know, if you're a manager, and you only have five people, you don't get to see the individual results. If you have 100 people, you do. Um, we have to make sure some of those safeguards are in there, too, so that the participations are inherently anonymizing. So we're watching that as well. And the other one that's interesting is going to be what I call fuzzy hashing. So the, the way that technology works is, is through a lot of hashing. So we're going to we're going to join things in, in a way that you can't see them. So you can you can use the data without seeing the data. Is, is the way I put it simply, right? Uh, for the geeks out there, you hash the data and the hash is still join even if the, you don't see the data. Well, the challenge comes when you have fuzzy things like addresses and names and phones. Um, if you don't master that in some consistent way, it's really hard to get that stuff to join anonymously. Um, and so now let's face it, that's hard inside the company too when you have full control of your own data. So you know, it's not like this is somehow more difficult. It's just that you know it's an inherent problem. Um, so watching out for how do you do, like if you really want to get into some of the advanced stuff. Like we know we can do stat filing over this network, yay. We, we know we can enhance the model and do something way better than stat uh, yay. We know that we can do sh data sharing among any, any parties who are interested in sharing as long as the data is crisp and it can be hashed cleanly. Okay. It's just when you get up to the fuzzy level, it's going to be interesting. But now we're at like, in, like crazy advanced levels. But those are the things that I'm just keeping an eye on. Yeah. Uh, Trim, well, go ahead. Oh, yes. Thank you. For Mobi, I think um, some of the most difficult things uh, that hurdles that we need to go over is first is education. Uh, this is a new way of doing things. Um, so, yeah. so how do we educate our members and the general public and, and get more companies to come in and join is education. It's, it's a new way of doing things, a new language. Learn the alphabets before you can write poetry. Um, and that's number one. Number two, uh, there's different level of understanding and at different times um, throughout the whole ecosystem. So there's early adapter and then there's late adapter. And how do you make sure that the early adopters still stay engaged, waiting for the late adopter to come? That is also another hurdle uh, that we are having. And, and then of course, the, the data model, like how do we agree? Um, it, even like for example, we call them battery birth certificate. What, what goes into that? We all have to agree before we can actually start communicating if this battery is really who it is what goes into mm -hmm. that data. So if, if this ecosystem works, um, I think, you know, open IDL and the ITN, which is what Movi's doing, uh, and Zootopia will stay around for a long time because we need all these data standards. This is a really new way yeah. of doing things. Somebody needs to do those. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And if I could, ahead, we've said if a number of times, right? So let me address that because to me, <laughs> you shouldn't have any fear of the blockchain. That's just, that's, that's good tech. Um, the theoretical pinnings of this idea, and, and again, I'm, I, I joke, I'm a theoretical computer science, but I, scientist, but I work for a living because I have to pay my mortgage, right? Um, and if I geek out too much, stop me, right? But the, the theoretical underpinnings of this whole move the data to the query, query the data, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's all sound fuzzies, hashes, all that good stuff, right? Um, the, the if you buy into the theoretical stuff or just believe some geek like me, okay, cool. You have several on staff, ask them, they'll understand what I'm saying, right? Um, and you believe the blockchain, the question becomes execution. Like, and I will say, the, the question you gotta ask is, you know, do we have the right bunch of people on this thing? And, and by the way, it's all public. It's because if you, anybody can join the meetings if they want to. But if you come into some of our, I think we have three working sessions right now, not including all the governance stuff. Um, one around the model, one around the infrastructure, and one around the architecture, the three major ones I know of, there might be more. Um, we really have a good army of people on this. So part of the question you want to ask is, if you're going to pull this off, who do you need? And I think we have them. So some of these meetings, we have 10, 15, 20 people on them. And, and they're people with, with 30, 40 years of experience who in, in the insurance industry. So, um, you know, if anybody cares to jump on too and talk about, you know, what we have behind this, we have the right resources. We want more. So if you're listening and you're interested, please join. But um, I, I'm very impressed. 
it, with the with the people we have, and it's really fun to just like design this stuff and think it through. Um, and we we chew through hard problems. So there is also the question of can you believe in the execution that we have going on? Um, and I do, and and I think we got the right bunch of people on it. In addition to the right theory, in addition to the right technology, so it's good stuff. It's just a long road. There's a lot to do here. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And Ryan, where do you see it? You know, uh, from your unique outlook in this, you know, on this panel, where do you see, you know, the biggest challenges or, um, you know, hurdles in the blockchain space um, in the industry? So when I look at this, I, I'm not going to be the one that speaks about the technology um, it, on this call. Uh, I'll leave it to Trams and Tram and, and James, who can get much more into the science of this. So I focus on the use cases, the, mm -hmm. the really the, the business opportunities that this could uh, help resolve. And I just really see them. Um, most of what I immediately go to is where the problems in the insurance industry are, right? Where I see within my own organization or hear it from other organizations where they're like, well, I don't have the data, so I can't seem to do this. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we feel like there's opportunity out there, but I don't have the data, so I don't know how to do this. We, we're being pressured from regulators to not use that data, but what data do I do? What data do I use? You know, then there's people who have literally have business models that keep data, in, you know, behind a closed door and try to monetize it, right? So um, that's what they're doing. And, and in a way, I get to this, you know, kind of um, uh, word where it becomes a non-functioning marketplace where there's everybody putting up barriers to working with one another, right? Um, and that's the business model is to make it difficult to work with one another. So I, I look at the, um, the opportunities here of, of where we can come together to, to solve these problems and yes, make a business out of that as well. So, you know, in, in use cases that I, you know, am personally involved in. So these may not be the biggest, most important, you know, societal or business opportunities in the world is the ones that Ryan cares about. So, um, but if you just look at you know, vehicle safety, you know, how, how do we prove out the, um, the frequency and severity benefits of uh, vehicle technology that costs thousands of dollars, right? Um, what? You know, how? How do we prove out which which way is is um, which system is better? Um, how should we address the risk of electrification? How should we address the the risk of shared mobility? Shared mobility, I would say, argue is another one. It's a non-functioning marketplace because the insurance costs are ridiculous. That people insurers are coming in and out of it. And therefore, knowledge is great. Knowledge is lost, and and when it starts to enter a market and leave a market. So, anyway, that that's where I focus is, is these opportunities where everybody has struggled, succeeded, and failed, and blockchain has the opportunity to at least create some persistent knowledge that ultimately would yield to a better performing market. Absolutely, and. Uh, you know, to that point, and I'm so glad you brought up use cases, I would love to go through, um, you know, current use cases, uh, POCs, um, past and successful ones that we've seen. Um, so Joan, I'll let you kick it off with that yeah. one too. Um, yes, and I, and I wanted to follow up, uh, you know, Ryan, you bring up a, a really good um, point in that you're interested in information that is inside a network being built around mobility and the auto industry. You, you need information there. They need insurance information in order to ensure a lot of the products and services that they would like to offer. So I want to go back and point to networks are critical to that. A centralized application, it, you're just not going to get there with that approach. You have to enable the information to be held by the carriers, by the automakers, by the mobile um, service providers, and you have to have a way to exchange that information and, and tying in what James has said. Each one of you, are you're going to hold on to your information 
out at the endpoints, you're going to see that query and you're going to decide how you want to answer it, whether it's to an automaker or whether it's to a carrier. You have to have a way to do that, some standards to do that. And by having an open network, you can do that. The centralized model breaks down uh, very quickly if, if that's the way you're thinking about it. Um, and we recently had a proof of concept that we ran with the North Dakota Department of Insurance. It was sponsored by uh, Commissioner Godfrey. And he wanted to know how many uninsured motorists there are in North Dakota. And he has a really hard time getting that information. Uh, and certainly it's the statistical data that we send today is two years old by the time a state gets it. So he doesn't know how many uninsured motorists there are today because the data he has is at least two years old. Um, and so he wanted a new way where he could ask carriers information about Car, we have cars that are registered in North Dakota. Are they insured? So that it's, you know, do we have a new technical platform that would enable me to ask that question, to get timely information and do it in a way that works well for the industry? And he said up front that he wanted to collaborate with carriers to see if there was a new technical platform that would enable that. So the North Dakota proof of concept was to prove that blockchain technology works. And the, and the commissioner, after the end of the proof of concept, said, yeah, the technology works. That there's no doubt about that. He and um, but he said it was interesting what we found. So with the queries that were on the network, we were able to match. Again, going to James's example, is that we had hashed vehicle identification numbers that the carriers have. We have similar information, a standard, a data standard. So we have vehicle identification numbers that the Department of Motor Vehicles has. And we were able to match those up, never exchanging the raw data or the vehicle identification number. It was never exchanged, never out in the open. But we were able to say, is this vehicle that we have registered in North Dakota, does, does it match? Is it a policy that's in force with any of the top 10 carriers that participated in this project? A couple of interesting things happened there. The first queries that we put together showed that 20% of the vehicle identification numbers didn't match, but not because they weren't insured. Data quality, data standards is really what came to the forefront there. We had uh, malformed vehicle identification numbers. We had uh, some records that were insuring an ATV. And it's not really a vehicle that's going to be on the road or insured with the Department of Motor Vehicles. So it wasn't the the POC was not about it was to prove the technology. It did that. But this is where I mentioned the iterative approach. What it did surface is that we need data standards and we need a way to help the carriers get the best information to the state so they can make good policy that benefits the industry as a whole around uninsured motorists. Um, so it was, a, it was a great proof of concept and uh, the, that wrap up is uh, going on right now. And I wish I could tell you what the follow on to that is, uh, but the commissioner in his message to the group said, he wants to continue in this open collaborative environment in which we build a network. He said the technology works, his approach, though, is to continue including the carriers with the regulators to develop the solution. And, and I think that that's critical to success. Absolutely. Um, and it's I mean, it's a great use case. And I think specifically for that one, Joan, it really the weight of it was what, you know, we didn't know and what we found um, within the POC. And I think, uh, you know, to that point, there's so much more. Um, that we will continue to find out with POCs. And it is almost a, an R&D play in a lot of ways for everyone that wants to participate. Um, so I want to open it up. Uh, you know, we do have um, 15 more minutes. I want to say to the attendees here, if you have any questions um, for our panelists, uh, please put those in the Q&A box um, and I can uh, run them by everyone. But Going back to the current use cases, uh, Tram, if you want to, um, you know, discuss any of those with Moby, that would be great. Yes. Um, so I think the the key to what we call the new economy of movement is the ability to link a 
trusted identity um, with location into a verifiable trip. And, mm -hmm. but we know location is PII, identity is PII. And, and so how do you do that in a safe way um, that you can still trust the location and trust the identity, but not revealing the VIN number, the driver and all that. Um, so one of the use case that we um, just finished um, a pilot with our members is the dealer floor plan audit. Um, we all know car dealership within the US and um, car dealership finance uh, their loan to be able to purchase these vehicles to be able to sell it to the consumer. And the, the lenders to the dealership, um, they want to know if their collateral is still on the lot. And, and there's maybe a few dealerships, sometimes they sell the vehicle and not report it because they want to hold on to the money and do more things with it instead of returning the loan right away. Um, so, so how do you keep track of all these vehicles? Are they still on, on the dealership? The lenders have to send physically somebody to the dealership with a clipboard, uh, sometimes with a scanner and, and still have to check off vehicles on the lot. And that's mm -hmm. a really time consuming way of doing this, this, this uh, uh, audit and within the US alone, if you can automate this process, it would save four to $500 million and that can trickle down to the consumer. Um, so the, in the pilot, uh, we have the lenders uh, pinging the vehicle and asking the vehicle, are you in this geofence location? And the geofence mm -hmm. location is the deal a lot. And then the vehicle then in turn, uh, just answer yes or no. And if they, they, yes, they're in the dealership and if you ping it for 24 hours, once an hour, and consistently, most of the time the vehicle says yes, yes, especially at 3 a.m. at night, right? <laughs> that vehicle better be in the dealer lot. Mm -hmm. um, so then, then you find yet dealership has all this vehicle in the lot. But if it's consistently ping, say, no, I'm not. Um, you don't need to know where it is. It's just not in the dealership. It could be out driven by a customer. Um, you don't mm -hmm. need to know that location. And if it does it multiple times, you have issues, then, then the lender needs to decide what to do about that. Um, so so mm -hmm. automation like that could save a lot of money, a lot of time, and near real-time data can then, that's foundational to many use cases to build on top of it. Like insurance, for example. Mm -hmm. Most dealerships now do not have health insurance, health insurance at all because that a lot of dealerships don't have a cover. And then how do you guarantee that the vehicle is actually being stored under the cover when the hailstorm mm -hmm. came mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So I think knowing this kind of information would be very helpful in the insurance industry. Absolutely. And I think that use case too, Tram, I, we can all, everyone, you know, in the industry can place, you know, that use case into many different uh, use cases in the industry. Um, and it's, it's fascinating and it's exciting. Um, James, I, do you have, yeah, go ahead, John. I, I was just gonna say, uh, it, to me, what Tram just talked about ties into what Ryan would like to see. Ryan wants mm -hmm. to know Absolutely. what's happening with that electric, electrified vehicle, what battery is installed, or has the latest software been installed in this car? And the yeah. insurance industry Absolutely. needs to be able to get access to this information, but the auto industry is going to be very, cautious about exchanging information because very often it's personally identifiable information and so that we stop and just as ryan said we stop working together because it's hard but if open idl and moby are working together now ryan has a way to ask is the latest version of the software in that electric electrified or auto driving vehicle and because we've been working with moby moby only has to come back and say yes and Ryan trusts that answer. That's the power of having it built in a network in which we have data standards and we can talk to one another. Yeah, I'll, I'll add some color to that. In the few yeah. months that you know I've been working with Open IDL, and you know the, the um, you know had a few calls with Tram now as well. It, you know, more use cases um, are keep uh, coming into mind. You know, you're, you uh, Tram just used the um the the dealership use case of um really just infrequently knowing about when a vehicle is at a dealership or not there uh within you know our business of course where a vehicle is when a storm hits is um a super big deal 
um, for property and, and vehicle insurance. There are also big governmental and societal issues around um, fuel use tax and toll ways, new models, road usage charging, and things like that, that are explored models. So just um, for example, throwing out use cases for people to, to, to feed on, um, you know, electrification is going to have a big impact on who pays for the roads when you're not buying gas anymore, right? So, you know, how, how you do that are, are big issues and there's opportunities to do that. I would, I would spend this a little bit, maybe throw a softball over to, to James, is um, some of these use cases seem to be not that complicated. Like the question Joan just asked me, you don't have to expose a rich data set that needs to be queried. It could be a relatively simple data set and therefore one thinks data standards would not be that big a deal, but I don't know. There's my softball to you, James. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there, there's a distribution here, right? So, you know, you typically, especially for engineers like me, we have a problem, which is we jump to the hardest case um, because it's because someone's going to ask us to solve it, right? But you got to sometimes remember that, you know, most problems are 80% easy, 15% medium, 5% hard. And so mm -hmm. when you get into like fuzzy hashing, which I'll explain as I go here, um, you're, up, you're up to the 5% use case. You're right. There's a whole bunch of bread and butter at the bottom. It just works. Um, and so, yeah, I, we just, we'd have to keep in mind that the distribution of complexity on this is there's a lot of simple use cases we can just win on if we start getting people plugged in. Um, a couple of things to observe, right? So if I go up and scale too, I, I don't want to talk about any specific use cases because that gets a little bit competitive. But the, um, the one of my other responsibilities is third-party data for the institution. And we bring in hundreds of data sets like all companies do. Um, but what's interesting is even though one of the major first cases that we're looking at this is in carriers feeding regulators. Um, and we're looking at the baby steps first, right? Again, start simple, which is just, can we just do stat this way? Okay, then can we expand stat? Okay. But what's interesting is you start to see um, opportunities where it's more of a B2B type thing, where if other organizations get onto the, the, the network, we can start sharing data that way. Now, granted, we already do that. All of us have a ridiculous number of feeds coming in and out of organization, but it's everyone's a different story and so on. Um, if you can get this consistent, what you can, you can find is that organizations whose job is, is data start to want to pile on. Trans organization kind of fits into that category already. Um, but but even all the traditional third-party data uh, vendors start to become maybe interested parties and in plugging in here. And you can already see this. There's a number of like, whatever you call it, data marketplace type vendors out there. And, and in order for these data marketplace type vendors to be successful, they have to have enough of the big data players, lowercase b, big data, uh, players plugged into their network. So that plugging into that network is, is key. But if this is open and people can start plugging into the network, um, then you can start having opportunities beyond just carrier to regulator, because while that's the first line of thinking, just like Joan said, the first thoughts of how the internet would work was not that your banking would be on there. Um, and if you can get there, it then becomes in the interest of businesses to plug themselves into this. And now we can start doing more exchanges along those sorts of lines. Um, so that kind of, that's it's an entire category of use case, which is just all the, the data augmentation you want to do, you can start getting on the network, um, particularly if you have fine grained security, again, at the transaction level. And then the last thing to consider on that is, we keep talking about zero trust because in zero trust, meaning that even if even if we don't trust each other, we can still use the pieces of data we care to share and we'll both be successful as a result and yet we'll both be safe, right? But there is something to be said for one-way trust relationships because if you're gonna start piling your third-party data onto this network, if one party can trust the other party, in other words, if I'm a 3PD vendor, I'm like, yeah, you can see my data, I don't care. Insur insurance companies are not gonna say to the 3PD, we don't want you seeing our data if we can help it, right? But one-way trust opens up another interesting door, which is some of the hardest problems are around fuzzy things. Um, even Tram's notion of a, a geofence, is, what does that mean? Lat long can go down to like, what, eight, 10 digits, right? How exact, where exactly is the center of your house? Those are vague things. In two way, zero trust on a fuzzy notion, like where exactly is your house on a geocode is tricky. One way trust gets really easy. If you're willing to send me that geofence, whack, I can figure it out. So it's interesting too, that scale to ask, even if this is designed for zero trust, if we could in fact have a one way trust, you can also scale up in another direction there too. So also something to think about. Yeah, to, to add on to that, uh, James, we're looking at another proof of concept right now in um, collaboration with Mississippi in which they've contracted with a third party to go in and image uh, all of the affected properties after a cat catastrophic storm is hit. Um, and the state has access to that information um, and they're happy to make it available to an insurance carrier. So that's kind of the one way thing you can ask for it and you can get it. But the state has said, but you know what would be really great is if we give you those images, could you just tell us if that house was insured? That's huge. But even if you could tell me for how much, 
now I can very quickly create a report for FEMA so they know what kind of assistance we're going to ask for. And again, it's very simple. We don't need a huge data set to make this happen. It's a very few pieces of information. We just agree to how we're going to exchange it. Now, all of a sudden, the insurance carrier has the images. The state has what they need to help their citizens, and they have what they need to go apply for FEMA grants. Um, so again, keep it simple. And it, it just a lot, a lot of um, innovation happens when you keep it simple and you start doing these things iteratively. Absolutely. And we did get a, uh, one question in about um, kind of borders. And uh, I know Joan and Ryan, we've talked about this before, but um, in terms of, uh, you know, open ideal and our community right now being, you know, just focused on the U.S. But, um, you know, what, what do we all think this looks like, you know, expanding internationally eventually? That's why we're with the Linux Foundation. <laughs> exactly. Right? You're an international, you're the most successful, largest open source um, group in the world. And uh, you enable that, the development of technologies in an open collaborative way. Um, so that's how it becomes international. But Ryan's the one that works for an international company that it can actually put a solution on top of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, you know, we do with the few minutes that we do have left. Um, and I think that's a great question uh, that leads into, you know, we need more uh, participants here. And um, I don't know if anyone has thoughts about uh, you know, closing thoughts, how, how we can um, get more participants where, uh, you know, what, what we can do as a community um, to bring more people on. Go for Before it. Before we do that, let me answer Roland's yeah. question since he did ask it. The only, my quick yeah, observation, yeah. just reading in real time is, um, it doesn't sound like you need a whole lot of carriers to agree in order to get your first win. So some things you need network effects. You need to get a pile of people before yeah. you can demonstrate value. I would say find one insurer because if you already have all that stuff in your blockchain and you're giving me off yeah. them observer access, you just need one carrier to get their act together. So I would just say, just put maximum effort the one carrier you can find. I'm just guessing um, because yeah. if it, it, grab it, if they're if one insurer is willing to grab it, and they can demonstrate value. Just like Joan was pointing out that the two wins that we have on this thing so far, North Dakota and, and, and Mississippi, it's like, if you can just get those. So just an observation. I don't know how to do that convincingly because hey, if they say no, they say no, but you only need one win to really get the ball rolling would be my observation. Yeah, I would, I would, I, I was doing the same thing, James, breathing yeah. Roland's uh, question. And and um, I, I think that's a, that's a great answer because Certainly, there are those within any organization. We've we've touched on it a couple of different times on this call that basically their their first response is to resist data sharing or collaboration in in, in any way. That seems to be you know uh, you know their default operation. But working with one, and I think James, what you're explaining about even just one to one, um, you know, single what I forget what you called it, um, but the sing, single point collaboration, I think, is good. Um, don't let good be the enemy of great, um, and and then go from there. Clearly, there will be uh, the more scale that you, you bring against a given problem is is great. I would also suggest, from a global perspective, for your question, is that use cases around the world, even if it's just one to one, um, do have a uh, a reference case effect. Right? Hey, if it worked in North Dakota, can it work in another state? Can it work in the UK? Um, these type of addressing problems. So anyway, I, I, I share your pain, Roland, uh, to be honest, because, you know, trying to get attention on some specific use cases and getting people to take action is the name of the game. But, um, you know, start simple, I think, is one of the things Joan referenced here. Awesome. Um, well, I want to thank, first and foremost, um, all of the attendees today. Uh, for joining us and our questions. Um, and if questions are rolling in here, I will follow up with you for sure. Um, and I can touch base with the panelists and provide answers for you. Um, and I wanna thank all of the panelists and uh, it's been wonderful working with you and I hope uh, we can continue to expand our community. Thank, thank you. you all so thank much. You. Thank you everyone for hosting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I want to thank all of our panelists for their time today and thank you everyone for joining us. Just a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank, thank you. you.